Welcome to the InfoMullet YouTube channel. If you enjoy this content, please like or share. And if you'd like to support the InfoMullet by becoming a mulleteer, visit us on Patreon. We appreciate your support. Um, now, one of the things that people have been trying to um, sort of soften this blow on is saying, well, you know, we're struggling, we're going through this, but eventually we're going to get some herd immunity. And I hate to bring up Sweden. Every time I bring up Sweden, I get angry Swedes on my YouTube channel. All my YouTube videos usually get 20 to 30 views. When I, when I mention Sweden, it's up to like 500 and they all hate me personally. So um, I'm now speaking a week ahead of time. When the angry Swedes are now watching this on YouTube, understand I'm not picking on you out of any agenda. I'm not picking you out of like, I, I, I don't like Sweden. Um, I think Sweden's a fine country. I have lots of friends who are Swedish. <laughs> You know, it's like, but the the reason that Sweden has become an example is it's one of the few countries still experimenting with this induced herd immunity. And I know they don't want to call it induced herd immunity. They want to call it something else. And it's, look, it's okay. You know, when we started this in March, we all had different pandemic national responses. And this is why I tracked them. I was a supporter of something called the voluntary firebreak. No one remembers that, but I used to say, hey, I think we should do a voluntary fire break where businesses voluntarily shut down or move online. Festivals like Coachella and concerts, they, they voluntarily shut down. It was called the voluntary fire break, and I was an advocate in mid-March. That horse is not only dead, but glue that's been used a long time ago for a paste project, right? I gave up on that pandemic response because it clearly wasn't working. This is a novel virus. We're going to have to find the best evidence-based systems we can. And the thing you can't do in a pandemic, you can't make a death pact with your first choice, right? You can't get so stuck on a strategy that you're not willing to adjust based on the evidence. And where Sweden comes up is it's got this kind of commitment, regardless of what the evidence is, that things are going to be okay, things are going to be fine. Because even if we had more people die than any other Baltic country and the economy tanked and we weren't able to protect the elders, at the end of it, we're going to get herd immunity. You know, we're going to have herd immunity. No one else is. Well, a, a, a research just came out from the um, Royal Journal of Medicine and it doesn't look good. <laughs> so sorry, Sweden, um, for those who are going to be really upset with what I have to say. Again, I'm not picking on your agenda, but as someone who, as a country which stuck with the tactic of induced herd immunity as an outlier amongst your neighbors, you're now the placebo case, right? You're the one who didn't get the medicine. So we're using you as, a, as an example to say, well, what happens if they didn't put in place? And um, the estimates, so when we talk about herd immunity, there's a debate that's going on Classically, people will say you need to between 60 and 80% of the population. There's some models that are going on that saying, well, maybe we can get away with 50%. You know, people are, are juggling numbers around. Sweden initially projected that they would um, get a 40% seroconversion, which is, you know, antibody in Stockholm by May of 2020. So they, you know, not necessarily 50, 60, 70%, but a good chunk, 40%. And they certainly had an outbreak in Sweden to you know, test that theory. Well, the art and the articles in the links, um, <laughs> they, uh, they, they didn't found any good news. So they're, what, what they're found is that it's basically right now, I think in Sweden, it's about 15% antibodies. So instead of being 40%, it's 15%. And the reason why they found this, and it's, it's let, me, let me share this um, graphic here, because they looked at a bunch of different countries here. Um, here's the, the meta study. Again, I only try and do research that combines the results of many studies. I'm not trying to do individual ones, but they had the country and the city that the, st the study was done in, the date. Uh, this, this, this row here is your key. This is your, your percent antibodies and what population was tested. Um, and the reference citation, again, in the paper, this is the footnote. So you can see these studies here. First of all, no countries near herd immunity, right? The highest level country or the uh, situation, New York City, you would think if any place had herd immunity, it'd be New York City with the super spreader event they had in April. Um, they had, excuse me, March and April. They tested it in May, June. New York City only has 21% herd resistance, right? That's a problem for the herd immunity theory. If your, your worst case scenario of a city outbreak hasn't gained half 
of what your herd immunity is, all the rest of these are less. And that's not a good sign. And part of the research shows, and this is the part that's kind of disturbing, is it's showing that all of these mild and asymptomatic cases, remember when I said earlier in the college that, you know, Chapel Hill is like, hey, these are asymptomatic. So the students, you know, they're not necessarily hurt. I wanted to key in on that phrase because what this research shows that I haven't seen done before is it says, if you get a mild and asymptomatic case, chances are you're not going to gain resistance. And that's a very big difference. And I think the mental model people had that said, well, lots of people are getting it. Some are having bad outcomes, but a lot of people are asymptomatic and that will help the general cause for herd immunity. What this research seems to show is that um, that's not the case. I may have herd immunity because I didn't have a mild case. I had a moderate case. Some people would call it severe. But even my immunity, they speculate, even if you have it, it may be three or six months or at most a year. It's not going to be this herd immunity that I think people want, this panacea where we'll get herd immunity absent a vaccine. Um, and now people, so let's go to some of the questions here. <laughs> Jerry Spaulding, quote, I don't like Sweden, the info mullet. Uh, Ed, I prefer calculus, but Sweden is okay. Look, don't even get me started on Swedish history because Sweden has a lot of good things going for it. But Charles XII, making that decision to go in the Ukraine, I can't understand it. That's the thing I'm talking about, right? If your strategy is not working, Charles, Chuck, Sweden, listen to me. If your strategy is not working and you're, you're heading to Moscow and you're in the middle of the Ukraine and your supply train's way behind you, turn around, go back home. It doesn't work out well. And that's what I'm afraid, you know, Sweden right now, to their credit, like all the Baltic countries, has a low daily case rate. So in some ways, yes, the current wave's over. The concerns that I'm rising, not just for Sweden, but for the U.S., because certainly we're, we're no great example, is this isn't over. Wave two is coming, right? We're in the middle of wave 1.5. Wave two is coming. These things will come in wave. And if you haven't learned the proper pandemic response by now, you're going to get hammered when this wave two shows up on top of the flu, uh, the annual um, flu outbreak. Um, herd immunity threshold dependent on the uh, R ought of the disease. So Tricia, this gets into a somewhat complicated, but if you imagine three stocks of population, the susceptible, the infected, and the recovered, and assume the recovered have a um, immunity, what you're looking about is when we talk about herd immunity, the susceptible are the people who can get it. The infected are the ones who can give it to them. Based on the uh, dynamics of how those two populations interact, there's a ratio within which, um, and, and you got to think about how long you have the disease, how visible it is you have the disease, and how long it takes the disease from an infected to go to recovered. So there's a couple parameters in there, but basically there's a ratio that exists for every disease that says if there's not enough um, susceptible people nearby to spread to that infected. So it's the R ought assumes um, the R value assumes that these people are within range to spread, but things that are like uh, social distancing or quarantine of the sick or other measures can reduce that available population within which it will spread to. So it's really about a ratio between that susceptible and infected stock. And the problem what we're hearing now when we do these stocks, I may use a simulation model in a future one, but if you were infected and recovered, at least it looks like for COVID-19, if you were mild or asymptomatic, you go back to susceptible because you don't have herd immunity or you, excuse me, you don't have antibodies. You don't have built-in resistance. And even if you have built-in resistance like me, if it wears off, you go back in susceptible. So there's a flow back into the susceptible stock from the infected stock. Jules is asking for the actual name of the study. Uh, pull it up. I've got the, the DOI link. Here we go. Journal of Royal Society of Medicine. The study is called Four Months into the COVID-19 Pandemic, Sweden's Prized Herd Immunity is Nowhere in Sight. I didn't want to read that title because now I'm going to get plus 20 angry Swedes just for saying prized herd immunity is nowhere in sight. But that's the name of the title. The DOI link is in the, the comments. Um, and Jennifer brings up mutations, uh, you know, um, science decoded, Lucas Hill, who is a muleteer, science decoded, I've got the link in there. This is another Facebook group that I recommend. Lucas is, does a lot of work in laboratories with COVID-19. He's taking a deeper scientific dive than I do. He gets into things like mutations and genetic variations and things like that. So I'd check out his Facebook page if you haven't. Um, Yeah, and, and now we've gone to um, uh, uh, jokes on the Swedish chef, which is only going to get me in more trouble. 
So that's, I mean, again, it's not the, the, the herd immunity thing isn't limited to Sweden, but it's the case study of Sweden chose a path where if you're going to see herd immunity, I mean, in an alternate universe, Sweden might have made the best choice. In an alternate universe, Charles II, 12th, may have captured Moscow and defeated Peter the Great, but that's not the universe we live in. So again, any pandemic response, whether it's the U.S. thoughts and prayers or the Swedish approach of herd immunity or any of these other things, you cannot make a death pact with your first strategy. You have to be willing to change it and adjust it based off the evidence. Thanks for watching the video. Hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to follow the InfoMullet, visit us on Facebook or Twitter. And if you'd like notifications when we post new video content, click on the red subscribe button below the video. If you've ever wanted to become a mulleteer and support the InfoMullet, visit us on Patreon. We appreciate the support.